so much gratitude uh, for Chris's um, mentorship and efforts with Osmocosm. He is a co-founder and a vice president in charge of academic affairs. Uh, also a professor at RISD, where, where, where um, he has taught many interesting courses. In, uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, honored to be invited to, to do a little bit of a guest lecturing there too. And we taught a course together, a, a little uh, vignette type thing where we spoke about emotions. And that's how we connected. We, we both sort of fell down this rabbit hole realizing that uh, the emotion in the language, or the language of emotions, which connects directly your perception to your behavior, is actually the basis, the, 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 the sort of the, the basement or the foundation, on top of which spoken language and spoken intelligence, mathematics and the rest of it, is built. So you feel first, then you think. It took me a long time to understand this. I was always thinking, oh no, think first, then feel. Nah, -uh. <laughs> feelings and emotions come first. So understanding that language is a, uh, is a, is a good motivator for, for any kind of science. And we connected over this, and we have had uh, several years now of just these exchanges where we used to meet uh, once a week and, and spend an hour just um, uh, throwing ideas around. We should do this again, Chris. But anyway, I would like to introduce, uh, I would like to let him give you his perspective on how we can learn from nature. Chris, please take it away. Just, I want to quickly pick up on the last question about hearing loss. Um, but what the image you're looking at is at the Nature Lab at Rhode Island School of Design, where I worked for the last 12 years, um, where we brought people from various disciplines together uh, because people see very different things when they look at um, something that we're all looking at together. Um, the thing I just wanted to mention about the last speaker was that David Eagleman at Stanford University has uh, developed a vest, especially for deaf people, uh, that uses mobile phone vibrators dotted over the vest. And using what he calls a potato head model of the brain, which means that you can plug in any input to it and it will eventually adapt the signal to what we call qualia. Um, it will actually eventually learn to turn it into a subjective experience of hearing. So that's something that you might like to look into, Julia. Um, anyway, this, um, this image, one of Michael Benson's pictures of the Nature Lab, uh, and I can say, we're looking at it and um, comparing notes and things. Uh, learning from nature is the theme of what I want to talk about. Um, I'll just do that. And for example, if we're looking at this, we, we talk about a thing, some, a subject called formal morphology, which is how uh, nature uses the basic um, elements, like a Lego kit of what it's got, and adapts them for different environments and different ecologies. And this happens to be a vulture skull. Now, the point is it has, you can see that it's largely uh, a way of um, containing the eyes, very large eyes. And it also has a bony protrusion to um, protect the eyes as it goes inside a carcass because it has to go, it goes into environments which um, it needs to stop the eye coming into contact with because it's got a focus. Now the interesting thing is that this eye has what is called a sclerotic ring. So our, our eyes are soft, uh, soft globes, they don't have this. But the sclerotic ring is a bony circle that is secreted uh, from liquids. That's the, how the body makes hard materials. It secretes them out of uh, liquids and the sort of squashy materials. Um, it, anybody interested in photography will recognize this as uh, being similar to when you buy a very expensive camera. Well, in the old days when we used to buy cameras, um, the expensive ones had metal-to-metal -metal contacts on the lens and the receiver. And in this case, the sclerotic ring is a particularly rigid fixation for the lens, so it has a very precise ability to focus. Now, there are some animals that use vision in different ways, um, but uh, the Nature Lab has a collection of all sorts of things like this. And 
the kind of when we were talking about uh, while Chris is doing this let me uh, say something that he taught me which was prescient and it has now become a proper science he taught me that um, tears human tears would have most certainly a different composition depending on the emotional state that caused them if you're just walking around and some wind blows some dust in your face, you have tears to get rid of the dust. If you're crying because of something sad, you have tears coming out of your eyes. Both cases, tears out of the eyes. If you do the LCMS, the liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy of those two to understand what kind of uh, components go in the tears, completely different you should expect, and in fact it's true. Now they found the same thing in dog tears. So dog tears have been analyzed and they are completely different depending on what cause them. And sometimes we now found that dogs will actually tear up at emotional states of their humans even. So there, there's a connection somehow. They're reading their human's emotional state and they're co-tearing up. If their human is crying, they might start crying too. If they're just getting watery eyes because of dust in their face, different composition. And that should have been obvious to, to someone like me, but it took Chris to ex actually explain to me. So these kind of cross-disciplinary feedings of ideas are essential to science. We have specialized far too much. We need this cross-disciplinary uh, pollination of ideas, cross-pollination of ideas. Okay, Chris, your slides are back up, so go ahead. Can you see the leaves? Yes, we can see the leaves. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, it's, it's a question of how do you see things and what you're looking at, because um, the truth is always in nature um, immediately in front of us, but we often don't see things that are immediately in front of us. So this is an example of um, what uh, we call, there's a word for this called autopoesis, which means that, uh, you know, if you think of this in relation to machine learning and artificial intelligence, this raises an interesting question that autopoesis in nature um, is about the proliferation of cells, a uh, very large proliferation of cells when things, something is growing. And this applies to all living things. Um, it grows very quickly, so the scale change is enormous. But the particular poetic identity of, of this, whether it's a, a sycamore tree, a tulip tree, a puma, a snake, this kind of thing, uh, this means that there's a point at which the um, poetic expression or the identity of the living thing is not only maintained, but it stops at, at the point of perfect expression. Now, <clears throat> with machine learning or artificial intelligence, I simply don't know whether that uh, has been solved yet, whether something knows internally when to stop. Um, machine processes one tends to think of as continuous, or I do, as a designer. So I am peripheral to the kind of thing that um, Andreas is involved with, but on the other hand I have a great interest in science, so it's a question about what you see. Um, I'll just get rid one of other thing that uh, was mentioned yesterday was um, something that happens in nature is the dimensionality of things uh, varies enormously. Uh, it, uh, the natural system, uh, or in other words, how your brain works, appears to be able to both reduce the number of dimensions and extend the number of dimensions. Um, this is an example of vision and, uh, and hearing. So the architecture, neurologically speaking, is very similar. So it, it takes an input of X number of um, components. Uh, like we were saying, the olfactory sense has a, a certain number of receptors. But then it has to compare them at, uh, in different ways, in threes and fours and fives and tens and so on. But all the systems, uh, it, it um, relies upon compressing the information. It's what's called a compression rung. And then it is expanded again to um, another longer layer and then compressed again. And there's at least seven times this happens in the neurological pathway to the brain. And the signal that, um, that turns into a recognizable qualia and eventually gets converted into a subjective experience 
is the one that survives this process of, ex of uh, continual compression and expansion. Um, so I thought that related to some of the things that emerged yesterday when uh, the dimensionality of things of natural systems and how we understand them was, uh, was mentioned. So that's all I wanted to do really was to talk about the, the event in the nature lab at uh, Rhode Island School of Design is um, a place where many disciplines could come together and it's not only the actual existence of what we call a discipline in itself, but it becomes obvious that um, the discipline doesn't exist in isolation in nature, that you need many different views coming together and asking questions. And they might seem like naive questions, but they're often very much the most productive ones. Um, anyway, I'll stop there because I know you're under time. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Chris. Uh, I'm opening it up to, uh, for questions for Chris. Please uh, go ahead and ask. And uh, while you're thinking about a question, I'm going to also tell you that the uh, Nature Lab at RISD is in an incredible place. I was so pleased and, and just lucky to know Chris who invited me there. Petra, my daughter who you met earlier, managed to handle your snake your corn snake, you, you've all seen your little orange snake, that, and she lost her fear of snakes immediately. And um, another thing that we learned with Chris is that uh, one way around fear is curiosity. So we gave this lecture about how I, I was uh, deathly afraid of spiders. I had an arachnophobia. And then uh, I've, I cured it, and I'm no longer arachnophobic, by asking questions about spiders and getting curious about it. It turns out that your brain cannot handle curiosity and fear about the same thing at the same time. So if you're very afraid, a good trick is to try and force yourself to start being curious about whatever it is that you're afraid of, and suddenly your fear will go away because your brain cannot maintain those two emotions at the same time. It's either fear or curiosity. You can't have both. It's sort of um, uh, fear and appetite also. You know that in movies, they always throw, you know, the, the burglar is coming in and there's a big angry Doberman guarding the house and they throw them a stake. And the Doberman goes for the stake and then they can burgle the house. This wouldn't happen because the dog when angry and agitated by the burglar will not actually go for the stake. Even though, you know, they're constantly hungry, some dogs. You cannot be hungry uh, and act on your hunger and also deathly afraid at the same time. Though one or the other is possible. Carolina, you have a question? Go ahead for Chris. Hi, Chris. Carolina here. So um, you've been working in the design field for many, many years and uh, been in RISD um, for a lot of time. I have a very uh, maybe general question, but um, I kind of was wondering, um, since you've been studying nature, different aspects of nature, not only olfaction, what um, what recently inspired you most or, or what kind of um, exposition to nature affected your work? Um, well, I, it's funny. Um, I'll tell you something that happened uh, 10 minutes ago. I was just staring at the screen and the various people on the screen. And I just noticed something that um, people have, everybody has one mouth. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the reason you have two nostrils is that anything like anything that has uh, two of something like a forked tongue of a snake or two ears, or in the case of an owl, uh, one ear high up and one ear lower down, it's all anything to do with two sensory organs placed in a relationship to each other is to do with stereo information. Now the mouth is not to do with stereo information. So one is in and uh, the other is out. It's a perfect kind of yin yang situation. Um, and that's just another way of looking at, uh, at this kind of thing. Uh, that's the first thing that happened. <laughs> I could go on. Okay, so, uh, all right, thank you so very much, Chris. So uh, with this, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, 